Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part four, and this is going to be the final part of our evaluation of suspected small bowel obstruction. And what we're going to do is finish up on a few different topics and a few other things that we need to consider when we're looking at suspected small bowel obstruction. Now, I left you last time with this case. You see a markedly distended stomach and duodenum, and you see some air in the abdomen, so there's pneumoperitoneum. So we know there's perforation somewhere or other. And then as you follow it downward, unfortunately, you see pneumatosis. You see extensive pneumatosis in the small bowel. This is classic for ischemic bowel. If you look at the air here, and then you look at the pneumoperitoneum, that's a bad sign. Probably if you had the liver, you would see portal venous gas. Also, look at the size of the mesenteric vessels. The patient is hypotensive. There's poor renal enhancement. And look how extensive the air is in the mesenteric vessels, as well as in the bowel wall. This is ischemic bowel, but really is infarcted bowel. So if you miss small bowel obstruction, if the patients present late or present with a range of varying symptoms and somebody is not aggressively on the patients, you can go from what looks like dilated bowel to ischemic bowel with high morbidity and mortality very, very quickly. And here's just a really nice example. Portal venous air, pneumoperitoneum, air in the mesenteric vessels, and extensive pneumatosis. And look at the size of the vessels. Look at the SMA. Look how small it looks. Again, we talk about, I can't give you a normal size for SMA. You know what it kind of looks like. When you see very tiny vessels in pruning, it also means the patient is hypotensive and there's low flow to bowel. So one of the things I also look at, you know, we talk about SMA or celiac occlusion or branch vessel occlusion. Even if all the vessels are patent, if I see the vessels are very tiny, like in this case, I would say the patient has really small vessels. This is consistent with poor flow to bowel, and I am concerned about ischemic bowel. Now, obviously, in this case, there are many other features, but sometimes the only feature we, we may see will be the small vessels. And again, really extensive uh, portal venous air. Uh, can you survive? We've seen a few cases. Obviously, there are other causes for venous air, including iatrogenic causes. But if it's due to ischemic bowel, your morbidity and mortality is it's a mortality of over 90%. So just another impressive example showing you the portal venous air, the pneumatosis, the small vessels. Now, another thing to remember is oncologic patients are particularly problematic. They may have complications just related to ischemic bowel, they're older patients, but they also have vascular bowel, hepato, pancreatic, biliary, and bone marrow related complications. This could be due to their disease process or from the cancer treatment. And so we, in these patients, we especially need to be careful knowing that it could be the disease process, it could be their aging process, or it could be related to chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Bowel obstruction in oncology patients can happen directly as a result of tumor or a sequela of post-operative adhesions, mesenteric defects, or post-radiation changes. Patients with bowel obstruction present with abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, distension, and increased stool and flatus. Up to 15% of intestinal obstructions have been associated with cancer. Bowel obstruction complicates up to a third of colorectal cancer patients, leading to malignant obstruction, and up to 50% of ovarian cancer patients. Small bowel obstruction happens more frequently than large bowel obstruction. However, unlike the case for large bowel obstruction, primary neoplasms are less likely to be the cause of small bowel obstruction. Small bowel obstruction still, even in this group of patients, is more likely adhesions or inflammation. And even in the cases with malignant obstruction, the etiology is mostly peritoneal meds from breast, melanoma, or lung cancer, rather than primary small bowel tumors. So it makes us think a little bit differently in patients with known malignancy, but you have to be thinking about the similar things plus additional possibilities. Now, we also can look at bowel obstruction for disease specific. So we could say Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease, what's the common obs problems? Obstruction. Perforation, rarely, but obstruction, which leads to abdominal pain. 
In Crohn's disease, we look at mucosal hyperenhancement. We look at wall thickening up to a sonometer. We look at neural stratification, seeing the multiple bowel layers. We look at prominent vas erecta, and I showed you some cases earlier. And we look at associated mesenteric fat stranding. Here's a nice example, a patient with Crohn's. Look at the duodenum. Look how the second and fourth portions are dilated. The third portion is narrowed and actually just past the fourth into ligament of trites. It's narrowed as well. We talk about Crohn's typically in ileum, but it can involve any part of bowel, including duodenum. This was a stricture in the patient's mid duodenum, which is causing proximal bowel obstruction. And there was another stricture, which is causing the latter part of the duodenum to be obstructed. Just really nice examples of Crohn's disease causing gastric outlet obstruction because it's causing small bowel obstruction. Very nicely shown here on the cinematic rendering. Again, really nicely that infiltration of the patient's bowel and the obstruction proximal to it. Another case, markedly dilated small bowel loops up to seven and a half centimeters. Mesenteric vessels are patent. We track this down to distally, uh, where the patient has a transition point. Obstruction can be near sites of prior surgery, as well as classically in distal small bowel. Here's a very nice example where you see the dilated bowel, and it's easy to see on coronal this long loop of thickening. And so my opinion was this was Crohn's disease. Long loop of thickening was causing the patient's obstruction. Uh, patient has had symptoms on and off, and so they decided finally to operate on this patient. They did operate, and I just felt they would find inflamed bowel and thickening, and that was actually cancer. So remember, patient with Crohn's disease has an increased incidence of small bowel adenocarcinomas, and with long strictures, it can be something that happens. Now, I have to admit, it's really hard to call it on CT. If not, you're going to call every case with thickened bowel can't rule out malignancy. But occasionally, you can be fooled. And even at surgery, they didn't suspect a tumor when they palpated it. They just simply resected. CT enterography is used now frequently for the evaluation of inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's patient. Here's a nice example. Um, again, it's a neutral agent. The bowel is dilated. The thickening of the small bowel distally right there in the ileum. Here it is, some of the ileum in cross-section, the prominent submucosal enhancement, the obvious wall thickening. And then you can see when you look at the coronal views how extensive the bowel wall involvement is. You also see the prominent vas erecta. Here's the cecum. So it's a long segment of terminal ileum involved, a little bit of fluid, narrowing, prominent vas erecta, and extension through the ileocecal valve. And when you look at it on the volume rendering, the increased enhancement of the bowel, the inflammation, very nicely seen, the differential layers, very nicely seen, and the prominent vascularity, very nicely seen. So again, a classic example of Crohn's disease. If this wasn't Crohn's, you could think about ischemia, though it's a little bit too long. You could think about other infectious etiologies as possibilities as well. But with the length of involvement, with the vas erecta prominence, with the presence of nodes, this is most classic for Crohn's disease. And again, just very nicely shown. Another patient, we talk about obstruction, acute abdomen. And you can see some dilated bowel, and then there's this inflammation in the root of the mesentery. You can see these multiple little dots, and here's the bowel that's inflamed. Now, this is not large bowel, because then you would say diverticulitis. This is small bowel, and everyone forgets that there is small bowel diverticulitis. Small bowel diverticuli are most common in the patient's uh, duodenum, but they're usually just diverticuli, and large ones often but more common when you have diverticuli in the small bowel, typically it's jejunum or ileum, you can get diverticulitis. A very nice example of inflammation. Here it is on the coronal view. So you see the small bowel, you see the inflammation around it, and you see the multiple diverticuli present, which allows you to make a very specific diagnosis. Again, just some nice examples of that. And this was a case of jejunal diverticulitis. Here's another example of another case of jejunal diverticulitis. Here's the inflammation. Here's the diverticuli. Here's the stranding around it. Sometimes this is easier to see when you had positive contrast on board. Since we usually use neutral agents, it's still easy to make the diagnosis. Inflamed bowel, 
extraluminal inflammation and multiple tiny diverticuli, a little better seen in the first case than in this case. We wrote an article about this, oh, that's a long time ago, uh, talking about jejunal diverticulitis and how it's a great mimicker. We talk about the CT findings in ileal diverticulitis can probably not be differentiated from those of other processes, talking about right-sided colon diverticulitis, but it's something people need to consider. We talk about the prevalence is relatively low, but complications including diverticulitis, perforation, obstruction, and hemorrhage are rare, but can occur, but it's an unusual diagnosis. There was a more recent article by Benitez talking about this process, talking about the uh, jejunal and ileal outpouchings with air fluid levels, debris and enteric content representing small bowel diverticulitis. And again, it's uncommon, but you can make the diagnosis. Uh, one of the things is you can't see perforation, not uncommonly. You can see an abundance of inflammatory changes, fluid and gas, which sometimes obscure where the origin is. If the diverticulosis of the small bowel attracts very much to the left or very much to the right, you may see involvement of the large bowel, and then you probably would be thinking about large bowel diverticulitis involving the small bowel, because that's more common. And again, with any diverticular disease with perforation, you can see local abscesses, hepatic abscess, and even portal vein thrombosis. And we also, in this long list of things we spoke about before, we talk about inflammatory and infectious disease. We spoke about diverticulitis, small bowel. We mentioned Crohn's disease, but there are a range of processes. Patient with abdominal pain, look how dilated these folds are. They're also markedly thickened. There looks like nodes in the mesentery. There's thickening in the mesentery. There's haziness in the mesentery. What are we dealing with? Could this be a malabsorption process, such as sprue is something we need to really be thinking about? Could this be infectious etiologies? The very distal bowel looks a bit thickened, but not as dilated. So what are we thinking about here? Markedly thickened small bowel, edematous changes in the mesentery, the vessels are patent. This is not a tumor picture with thinking as noted infectious or inflammatory. The vessels branch normally. It doesn't look like Crohn's. It doesn't look like ischemic bowel. Vessels are all patent. We already said that. It looks like some other process a really edematous small bowel. Drug reaction is a possibility. We can see drug reactions. Patients with ACE inhibitors get markedly thickened bowel, which often can lead to ischemia or be confused with ischemia. Here, the vessels are all nicely patent. This was MAI infection. So unusual infections, TB can give uh, thickened bowel, but it's more common in the terminal ileum. And with TB, you often see nodes and the nodes are of low attenuation. Here the patient had thickening of bowel and nodes. This patient uh, had AIDS, and patients with AIDS and HIV are more common to get MAI infection. But again, you need to, in the right setting, think about infection. Or this case, look how prominent this uh, jejunal loop is, and it's only the jejunal loop. So when I show this case in conference, edematous changes in jejunum for 10 centimeters, let's say, but the rest of the bowel looks good. The mesenteric vessels look good. What disease gives you jejunal thickening only? There aren't too many things that do that. And look how edematous the folds are. What gives you markedly edematous folds, thickening with stranding in the mesentery? And that's going to be infection as well, giardiasis. We think about giardiasis as being jejunal involvement. Some of the other infectious etiologies are more common in the terminal ileum. Giardia is most common in the jejunum. So particularly in the summer, people get all sorts of infections from eating spoiled food. You got to think about uh, giardia, particularly when patients have diarrhea. If it's more than one person sick, as an example, really nice example. Now, in terms of vessel impression, we spoke a little bit about vessels. We talk about looking at patency of vessels. And I'll talk about that in a CTA talk separately. But one thing that gives you bowel obstruction is SMA syndrome. The angle between the SMA and the aorta is decreased. And you get two compressions. One is the duodenum. And one is the patient's left renal vein. 
It was classically described as patients with marked weight loss. We also see it in skinny patients. Normally, the SMA angle to the aorta is about 45 degrees, while in SMA syndrome, it's under 25, usually under 10. And the distance from SMA to aorta is also markedly decreased. Now, you can see narrowing of the SMA angle in just thin patients and normal patients, more common in patients who've lost weight. But to have SMA syndrome, you need obstruction. So give lots of oral contrast, particularly water. Here, the stomach's distended. And then you see the second to third portion of the duodenum distended. And you track the duodenum behind the SMA. The distance is small, and you see the transition point, and you see it on the coronal view. So for me to call SMA syndrome, I need the angle decreased, but I also need duodenal obstruction. If the duodenum and stomach is collapsed, you may not be able to make the call. So give lots of water, 500 to 750 cc's minimum, to be able to make that diagnosis. And SMA syndrome is a very important diagnosis. These patients often are seen by doctor after doctor, having all sorts of symptoms, including weight loss, nausea and vomiting, and the like, but the diagnosis is not made. Here in the sagittal view, it's obvious that the angle of SMA to aorta is decreased, the distance is decreased, but it's the dilatation of the duodenum and the cutoff that allows you to make the specific diagnosis of SMA syndrome. And you can see it here very nicely. Again, another example where the SMA is here, and there is the dilated duodenum nicely shown on the volume rendering. And here it is again. The bowel is dilated. There's the transition. There's the SMA. Decreased angle. Renal vein is compressed. Very, very classic. So again, sagittal views are very helpful. Coronal views are helpful. But the prep of the patient is especially helpful. Another example here, patient with nausea and vomiting. Look at the duodenum. Look how dilated it is. There's a transition behind the patient's SMA. The SMA angle is decreased, not as much as the last case. The renal vein is flattened. SMA is compressed on the patient's duodenum. And just a very nice example of SMA syndrome. And here it is again as I do the coronal view. There's the SMA. There's the patient's dilated bowel, and there's the transition precisely at the right point, right there. And finally, a third case, again, nice duodenum dilated, transition point right near the SMA. There's a really good look at the volume rendering and the coronal view. There's the transition point, very classic for SMA syndrome with SMA obstructing the patient's duodenum as it tracks behind the SMA and between SMA and the aorta. Just a very nice example from a range of different perspectives. Now, if you ask me what are we gonna do better in the future, well, part is experience, part is a challenge. There is some work being done, and I don't know how successful it's gonna be. Here was an article published recently talking about machine learning predicting closed loop obstruction, teaching the computer to read the scans. That may indeed be possible. And I think it's something we're going to be looking at because we're looking at it in every part of radiology, whether it's brain or breast or bowel. Whatever it is, we're always going to look at AI and will AI help us do better? Will AI be able to converge the clinical presentation, patient's history, symptoms, and imaging together to reach a better diagnosis? We'll see where that goes, but it has to be of interest to us. So, and in conclusion, they had said that when applied to CTs obtained to assess bowel obstruction, a model combining supervised 2D and 3D convolutional neural networks effectively identified CT showing evidence of bowel obstruction. Now that's good, that's a start. It's a long way from that because a med student can pick up bowel obstruction and anyone trained can pick up bowel obstruction. The question is the why, the whens, and how we manage patients. And if you can manage patients better with AI, it's gonna be very, very valuable. So. There are key points. We are learning, we are changing. Whether the learning is how to read the scans, how to manage the clinical aspect of the patient with the scans, or looking to the future at the impact of AI, whatever we do is constantly changing. But some things don't change. CT is the study of choice when we're looking at suspected bowel obstruction. When used correctly, it plays a major role in patient management and triage, who goes to surgery, 
who is managed conservatively, what is the cause of obstruction, be it tumor, be it adhesions, be it inflammation, whatever the cause we're really good at. And again, technique is very important. Challenges in interpretation often relate to less than optimal techniques in non-dedicated studies. But as long as the patient's bowel is extended, and again, in the ER setting, using IV contrast, one of the first slides of this talk was about 30% misses when you don't use IV in the acute abdomen. So use IV, use water as an oral agent, and I think you'll do terrific. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and see you next time. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.